The teleological argument for the existence of God is an argument which seeks to prove that the universe and or life was designed. This, of course, isn't meant to prove God outright, it's simply meant to serve as one piece of evidence. In a nutshell, the teleological argument states that the universe and or life show clear hallmarks of design, which any honest observer would recognize. What are these hallmarks? Well, for now, let's just call them trait X. Stated formally, the teleological argument would be something like this. If something has trait X, then it was designed. Life and or the universe has trait X, therefore, life and or the universe was designed. So the question is, what exactly is this trait X? What is it about certain objects that makes us so confident that they must have been designed? And does life or the universe actually have any traits that would suggest a designer? In an exploration of this topic, the theologian William Paley proposed a thought experiment in which he explains what he thinks the trait is which indicates design. I'm sure many of you have heard it before, but you're going to hear it again. Suppose I found a watch upon the ground, and it should be inquired how the watch happened to be in that place. I should hardly think that, for anything I knew, the watch might have always been there. Yet, why should not this answer serve for the watch as well as for a stone? For this reason and for no other, namely, that if the different parts had been differently shaped from what they are, if a different size from what they are, or placed after any other manner, or in any order than that in which they are placed, either no motion at all would have been carried on in the machine, or none which would have answered the use that is now served by it. This is a great example of the fact that we do seem to be able to distinguish design from non-design, since we would almost certainly notice a watch lying on the ground. But why? What makes us so certain that the watch was designed, while the dirt was not? Paley proposed that the reason we noticed the watch, and the reason we conclude that it was designed, is because we observe that all the parts of the watch seem to carry out specific functions, and if they were arranged or shaped in any other way, no function would occur. This is what many modern apologists have dubbed specified complexity, or just complexity for short, and it's this trait that most of them hold up as a hallmark of design. So, is this how we detect design? Is this the trait X that we're after? Well, no, I don't think so. First, let me explain what's wrong with Paley's proposal, and then I'll explain my own candidate for trait X. To show what's wrong with Paley's watchmaker analogy, I'm going to change the analogy slightly. What if, instead of finding a watch on the ground, we found only a shard of glass, as might be on the face of such a watch? Or, what if we found a copper cylinder? Surely we would instantly recognize that these objects were designed. And yet, these objects don't have parts which produce motion, and they don't seem to perform any sort of function. These objects lack the kind of specified complexity that Paley proposed as an indicator of design. And yet, it would seem obvious to us that these were in fact designed. What this tells us is that Paley's proposal for the trait that distinguishes designed objects from non-designed ones doesn't fit the bill. That being said, this isn't enough to completely kill Paley's proposal. After all, it may be that specified complexity is not a trait that exists in everything that was designed, just in some things, and as long as this trait doesn't give us any false positives, identifying non-designed things as being designed, then it can still be used to detect design. If life and the universe have specified complexity, then we can know that at least these things are designed, even if they're not the only things that are designed. Unfortunately for Paley, Specified complexity does give us false positives. It falsely identifies non-designed things as being designed. We have observed that specified complexity can indeed arise from the unconscious process of natural selection. Even if we ignore the theory of evolution, there is still plenty of contemporary evidence that specified complexity can arise in this way. For example, between 1971 and 2008, we observe the evolution of what are called sequel valves in a population of Italian wall lizards. This valve creates a sort of fermenting chamber in the lizard's gut, allowing it to better digest a plant-based diet, 
as opposed to the mostly insect-based diet of the original population, where this novel structure is not found. We've also observed a virus evolve a completely novel protein coat from a randomly generated section of DNA, a protein coat which serves a specific function, allowing the virus to infect host cells, but more on this interesting experiment later. So, not only is Paley's proposed trait, specified complexity, absent in many designed things, but it's also present in many undesigned things. This means that specified complexity simply cannot be used to detect design, and thus, it is not a good candidate for our elusive trait X. But hold on, I hear you say. What about irreducible complexity? What about things that couldn't have evolved? What about the bacterial flagellum? What about the blood clotting system? Surely these things are evidence of design. And this isn't necessarily a bad point. Irreducible complexity is arguably what Paley was describing about the watch. It's not just that the watch is complex, it's that all the parts have to be present, in the right proportions, and at the same time, for any function to occur. Take one away, and there is no function. Modern apologists simply add the observation that you don't get any useful function until the final piece is assembled. Thus, they conclude, systems like these could not have evolved gradually, one piece at a time, by natural selection, since natural selection has to work in small, incremental steps, each with its own beneficial function. However, the idea of irreducible complexity in living organisms has not only failed to pass peer review in any relevant field of study, but it was actually demolished in court back in 2005. In Kitzmiller v. Dover, advocates for what they called intelligent design appealed to the idea of irreducible complexity to try and prove that certain biological systems could not have evolved, therefore they must have been designed, and therefore intelligent design should be counted as science and allowed to be taught in classrooms. Unfortunately for the ID advocates, it turned out that there were literally piles of peer-reviewed papers on every system that they claimed was irreducibly complex, most of which they had not read, and all of which explained how these systems could have evolved, as expert witness Dr. Ken Miller explains. On cross-examination, Professor Behi was questioned about this claim that science would never find an evolutionary explanation for the immune system. He was presented with 58 peer-reviewed publications, nine books, and several immunology textbook chapters about the evolution of the immune system. However, he ignored all this and simply insisted that it still wasn't sufficient evidence of evolution and that it was simply not good enough. And the, 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 if you want theater in the courtroom, what the lawyer did was held up the first paper, have you read it? He said, no, this is a paper on the evolution of the immune system. Here's the second paper, have you read that? Yeah, I read that one. Uh, so forth and so on. And gradually, all 56 papers were piled up in front of the witnesses, a witness all nine books and all of these textbooks, and he simply said, it's evidence that is not good enough for me. So, as I stated before, neither specified complexity nor irreducible complexity seems to be a solid basis on which to infer design. So the question remains, how do we detect design? What is it about a watch or a shard of glass or a copper cylinder that makes us so damn sure that these things were designed? And more importantly, should we have the same reaction when we look at life or the universe, concluding that these two must have been designed? From what I've read, it seems that there is no hard and fast scientific or philosophical criterion by which we detect design. So, at the risk of sticking my neck out farther than I have any right to, here is my best guess for what our design indicating trait X could be. Perhaps unsurprisingly, my best guess is mostly in line with what David Hume wrote in Dialogues Concerning Natural Religion during a discussion between his two characters, Philo and Cleanthes. If we see a house, Cleanthes, we conclude with the greatest certainty that it had an architect or builder, because this is precisely the kind of effect that we have experienced as coming from that kind of cause. But surely, you won't say that the universe is so like a house that we can, with the same certainty, infer a similar cause. In lockstep with Philo, my proposal for trait X is the familiar shapes and materials, which we know from past experience came from designers. Even if it's not clear what the function of an object is, we can still conclude that it was designed by a human, because we recognize the materials and general shapes as the products of human designers. 
smooth, regular shapes made of metal, stone, or plastic. It seems to me that trait X is what you might call familiar craftsmanship. This is hammered home by the fact that, if we were presented with something that did not share these familiar materials and shapes, it would not appear designed to us, because we've never seen someone design something like that. Oh, God, gross and weird! Chris! You killed my gun! This is why we notice the watch lying on the ground, not because it seems to perform a function, but because it has specific features that we've seen in other objects that we already know were designed, smooth, flat metal in regular shapes. Even if the watch didn't function, we'd still recognize that it was designed. Heck, even if the watch had been smashed to pieces, and even if we'd never seen a watch before, we would probably still conclude that the pieces were designed, because we know that humans make these kinds of shapes out of metal. Experience is the hallmark of design, not complexity and not functionality. Now, in the interest of being thorough, I think it would be helpful to take a look at some edge cases, where our instinct on whether or not something was designed isn't very clear. These edge cases will demonstrate that it is experience, not complexity, which triggers the feeling that something was designed. Check out these rocks. They have regular, hexagonal shapes, which don't quite look natural, so we might think that someone carved them. On the other hand, why would someone bother doing this? Additionally, we know that crystals can grow in regular, macroscopic shapes all on their own. So, were these rocks designed? Or not? It's a tough question. Not because they seem to perform some kind of function, maybe, but because they have traits that we know from experience can arise from either design or non-design. As it turns out, the answer in this case is no. This was not designed. This rock feature is called the Giant's Causeway in Northern Ireland, and it's the natural result of a cooling plateau of lava. Although, interestingly enough, it's called the Giant's Causeway because of an ancient myth which said that it was built by, yeah, a giant. People once thought it was designed, and it's easy to see why. They didn't think it was designed because the parts served a function, but because they knew that humans, and presumably giants, would be capable of carving something like this. Experience, not complexity, and not function. As another edge case, take a look at this big chunk of smelted steel. Now, in this case, we happen to know that it was made by the blacksmith standing next to it, but if you stumbled across this thing half buried in the ground somewhere, would you recognize it as being designed? Maybe, maybe not. There's a good amount of metal in it, which we know usually comes from humans, although certainly not always. Volcanoes and meteorites can produce some pretty interesting metallic chunks as well. Also, this chunk doesn't really have any regular shapes that we recognize from other known designs. Once again, our experience is pulling us toward both conclusions. In this case, getting the right answer and concluding that it was in fact designed is a matter of experience. A normal person might come across this chunk of metal and say, wow, that's a cool volcanic rock, or hey, check out this meteorite, whereas a blacksmith who is familiar with his craft might come across this same object and say, hey look, someone didn't finish smelting their steel. Experience answers the design question, not complexity, and not function. So, to return to the original argument, if there is some trait, some telltale feature about an object that indicates design, it isn't specified complexity. It is familiar craftsmanship based on prior experience of known designs. The question now becomes, is this something we see in life or the universe, which would indicate that these things were designed? Well, no. We have no experience to speak to these things being designed. Making space-time? Making matter and energy? making life, these things simply do not have familiar craftsmanship in their shapes and materials. That is, they do not have trait X. Thus, the teleological argument does not prove that life or the universe was designed. As much as I'd like to leave it here, there's one other version of the teleological argument that I need to address. This version of the argument is made not about designers, but about intelligence, and its goal is to prove that life or the universe show clear signs of being the products of intelligence. 
Once again, this isn't intended to prove God on its own, it's just meant to serve as one piece of evidence. This argument is very similar to the previous argument, and it goes something like this. If something has trait Y, then it was the product of intelligence. Life and or the universe has trait Y. Therefore, life and or the universe was the product of intelligence. So, what could this trait Y be? Is there any sort of feature that we think must be the product of intelligence? As before, it's a tough question, but I think there actually is something that may fit the bill. Language. If something has features that identify it as a language of some kind, then, the argument goes, that thing must come from intelligence. For example, what if we discovered writing somewhere that no humans could have made? What if we discovered, for example, giant letters on the moon that said, God exists? Let's suppose that astronomers have been watching a comet for years, and all of a sudden, they do some calculations, they say, this comet is going to slam into the moon's surface tomorrow. And so the next day, you have the Hubble Space Telescope and all these planetariums that are zoomed in on the lunar surface, and they watch, boom, as the impact happens. And as the lunar dust settles, there's a message embedded on the lunar surface that says God exists, and it's in Greek and Hebrew. I do think this is a good thought experiment, and I probably would consider this to be evidence of some kind of intelligence. Now, you could argue that we'd only recognize the language because we ourselves have experience with complex language. If we didn't, then maybe we wouldn't recognize it as the product of intelligence. And that's a fair point. However, I find it really hard to imagine any intelligent being having no language of any kind. Our very thoughts are, arguably, structured by language, as Helen Keller recounts from the days before she was able to communicate, as indeed other people have attested in similar situations. Thus, it may be the case that language does go hand-in-hand hand with intelligence, and language may indeed be a relatively solid criterion by which we detect intelligence. Language may be our trait Y. After all, this is why we have SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. We do seem to believe that some kind of language from outer space is worth hearing if it exists, since, presumably, it would indicate some kind of extraterrestrial intelligence. So, does life or the universe have any sort of language, specifically, language that would indicate a godlike intelligence? Well, supposedly, yes. It's our DNA. DNA, apologists will argue, is not only a language, but it's also information. Therefore, it has to come from intelligence. Well, no it's not, and no it doesn't. Let me address both of these ideas about DNA. First, is DNA a language? No, it is not. DNA, as far as we know, has no symbolic meaning. It's a direct, one-to-one -one transcription from nucleotides to mRNA to proteins, at least in the case of coding DNA. Now, we humans could theoretically use DNA as a storage method for language, but this would require us to assign symbolic meanings where none currently exist. Furthermore, and perhaps more importantly, DNA does not follow Zipf's law, as all other complex languages do. This law observes that, in all complex languages, the most frequently used word is used twice as often as the second most frequent word, and three times as often as the third most frequent word, and so on. Our genetic code does not follow this pattern. For these and other reasons, DNA is not a language, and thus it need not come from intelligence. Okay, so DNA isn't a language, but is DNA information? Yes, but. There are many definitions of information, some of which do refer to intelligence, and others which don't. Some definitions refer to the transmission of ideas from one intelligence to another, while others simply refer to any specific sequence that has specific effects. This means that defining DNA as information does not require that it is the product of intelligence. In fact, we have actually observed, in a laboratory setting, novel, useful genes evolving with no guiding intelligence. That is to say, we've observed new genetic information arising spontaneously. Remember that virus that evolved a novel protein coat? Well, here it is again. 
In this remarkable study, this group of scientists showed what many biologists thought was so improbable it was essentially impossible. The evolution of entirely new genes from completely random DNA sequences. The exact thing creationists have been arguing is mathematically impossible. In this study, the researchers replaced a 139 amino acid domain of a gene that makes up the coat of a virus with a random DNA sequence. Without this protein domain, the virus is extremely inefficient at infecting cells. And if creationist math is to be believed, the chances of these 139 amino acids randomly mutating back is so unlikely, the virus will be doomed forever. However, in only seven generations, the group saw a 240-fold increase in infectivity of the virus. And after many generations, the virus had increased its infection rate by a factor of 17,000. Where once there was just random DNA, now existed a fully functional viral coat gene. But not the original gene. An entirely new gene had evolved to fill the role. Thus, even if DNA was classified as information, it would not require an intelligent source. So where does this leave us with the teleological argument? Well, we've determined that the trait which William Paley proposed as a hallmark of design, specified complexity which appears to serve a function, does not accurately tell us whether or not something is designed. Furthermore, the trait which does seem to indicate design, familiar craftsmanship from known instances of design, does not support the conclusion that life or the universe was designed. Even if we move the goalposts from design to intelligence, there is still nothing about life or the universe which indicates an intelligent source. Thus, the teleological argument cannot serve as a piece of evidence for God. Special thanks to Luigi Verona and Dan Piano for playing the parts of William Paley and David Hume. You'll find links to Luigi's website and Dano's piano in the video description. Thank you for watching. Subscribe for more.